The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 370. My name is Chris. My name is Noah. Hey, Noah. Good morning to you. Guess what, Noah? Big show today. Tell me. It's actually really? it's a different show than what we've really ever done before. Uh, this week, a the Linux Action show. show, a very special edition of the Linux Action Show, we visit Red Hat. And it's kind of um, a big day today. Red Hat stock hit a 15-year all-time high. It's a really big week for Red Hat, and so it was a perfect week for us to go out there and visit them, especially on a special day like today. So it's a special format of the big show. No picks, no news. It's just going to be us and our trip to Red Hat. Uh, Noah, you had a chance to go out there a little bit before self and uh, visit the campus, what was it like? What were your first impressions when you arrived at Red Hat? You know, I have to be honest with you. I, I've always been a fan of, of Red Hat. Red Hat was got, what got me pulled back into Linux after I'd been kind of turned off from Linux, and I, I had originally had a bad experience. And um, Red Hat, uh, I, I'd used Red Hat all the way up until they had split from Red Hat into Fedora, and then I became a Fedora user. And I've been a loyal, in, uh, a loyal Fedora user ever since. And I have watched from, from an outsider uh, the decisions that Red Hat has made. And it always appeared that they were committed to open source and the community, but I always kind of, I guess in the back of my mind, I always assumed to to get to a $1 billion mark, to get to that $1 billion mark and to exceed past that, you'd have to make some compromises, you'd have to cut some corners, and you might have to stab just a couple people in the back to get there. <laughs> and I guess what I was pleasantly surprised was as I was walking around Red Hat, they don't make compromises. And and they don't cut quarters. And they are they are just as committed, at least from what I could see from the inside, uh, just as committed as what I, ha even more so than what I had anticipated from the outside. And in talking with these people, I got a, I got, you can, you can tell that every one of those people that, uh, that works for, for Red Hat, it, it, this, it, for them, it is a, it is a core belief. They can teach skills. And they'll tell you that when we look for employees, we can teach skills. What we can't teach is passion. What we can't mm. teach is, is the life attitude that's required to work for uh, Red Hat. And I guess, to be completely honest with you, I left feeling kind of like a fanboy. But if I'm going to be, if there's ever, a, if there was ever something that I felt was, was worthy of the title of fanboy, if there's everything I was willing to take that, that, uh, hmm. that brunt for, it would be something like Red Hat, because they're that amazing of a company. Well, um, I'm hoping that comes through in the interviews. We'll see. I know I, I trust your sense to suss these things out, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Before we get into the first section, uh, I want to thank our sponsor this week. Week, and that's DigitalOcean. Head over to DigitalOcean.com. And remember, we have a very special promo code for you on the Linux Action Show. If you use our promo code LASTDIGITAL, you get a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean. LASTDIGITAL for a $10 credit. Try their $5 rig two months for free. DigitalOcean is basically my go-to Linux infrastructure now. A lot of times my approach would have been either my own dedicated server or setting up virtual machines and not anymore. Now when I need a virtual machine or I need a server or I need anything of the like, I make a DigitalOcean droplet, and I get started in less than 55 seconds, and pricing plans start only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. One of my all-time favorite uses for a $5 DigitalOcean droplet is OwnCloud and Quasal Core. And no, I don't know. I know you're an RSI guy, R R I S S I guy, but have you played around with Quasal much? You can throw it on a droplet, and it's super useful. Yeah, in fact, actually, during the fest, I wanted to. I, I originally, when I was setting up the machine, I needed to get on the air right away. <clears throat> and of course, because I had swapped out some of the drives, none of the original install from Linux Fest Northwest was there. So I was going to use my IRSSI client on the uh, on the stream, but to do that, then I needed another client that I could use so people could send me private messages. So I used the handle kernel Linux Quasel, and then once I kind of got hooked into Quasel, and of course, I had to spin that up on the fly at. Uh, Linux Fest Northwest on a DigitalOcean droplet right after I'd got done spinning up a DigitalOcean droplet so that we could move the FTP files yeah, there. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, I mean, this, I mean you, you don't understand. No, no ad read can do it justice as just coming and watching how this stuff makes our life easier in practice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was able to spin both of those droplets up. Again, took under a minute and then add my SSH key, stuck my Yubi key in, was able to log into both those boxes. I had Quasel set up and running in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and of course, I was using, I, I believe it was DigitalOcean as a guide on how to get Quasel Core up oh, and running. Oh, nice. Yeah, they've got um, a lot yeah, of great tutorials. So and I had that working, and then uh, and then obviously I had the FTP thing set up, but both of those were being powered by a DigitalOcean droplet. And then later on, I actually added the uh, I actually added the whatever it was JB Studio or whatever it was or JB Mobile, I think it was. The user was actually Quasel, and then for the rest of the stream, we are actually capturing a Quasel client, 
which was being pulled from the Quasal Core, which was running on a digital ocean That's droplet. That's so cool. Yeah, like Photon yeah. says in the uh, Photon says in the chat room, and I totally agree. Like uh, now, instead of like creating even like a like a, uh, a a virtual box machine, I just spin up a droplet because for five dollars yeah. a month, when you use the promo code Last Digital, you get a ten dollar credit, and they even have hourly pricing, so you, that ten dollars will last you quite a while. And their interface is so simple and intuitive. The control panel is so easy to use, but very very powerful that you can get a lot of very great co- tasks accomplished very very quickly. Uh, so use our mm-hmm. promo code Last Digital. Try it out for two months for free. And remember, they have data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London, and brand new one in Germany. And something I'm really excited to see is uh, DigitalOcean is um, really a friend to the open source community. They truly are a friend to the open source community. Uh, the elementary OS folks just posted on their blog that they're pulling out of SourceForge because of all of the recent um, crap that SourceForge is pulling with the installers and whatnot. And the reason mm-hmm. they're able to do this is because DigitalOcean is contributing terabytes and terabytes of bandwidth to make this Man. possible. Also, wow. uh, the, uh, word, the awesome WordPress alternative, Ghost, is moving its global infrastructure to DigitalOcean, saying goodbye to SourceForge. Isn't that awesome? DigitalOcean is wow. giving these open source projects some hosting to make this possible. You can go get your own server set up there. You get HTML5 console access to your own Linux rig up in the cloud. Just use the promo code LASTDIGITAL. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Last Digital, get that $10 credit. You guys, it's not just only a great way to support the show. It really is a cool service. Now, no, there are a million questions I have for the folks at Red Hat, but I like the idea of starting with one that's probably on the mind of our audience. You'll recall semi-recently that Red Hat purchased the CentOS project. And now some time has passed, and it leaves us wondering... What exactly is the relationship between Red Hat and CentOS? Put all the software that we develop out there under open source licenses so that people can take that software and that source code and use it as they need to. And uh, some people are going to pay us for that because we're able to show value above and beyond the actual source code. Some people aren't. Some people are going to want to take that code and use it for their own purposes. They're going to want to bring in in in-house talent. They're going to want to find someone else to do the work. They're going to hire somebody to do the work. And that's fine. And so I think CentOS is no different from that. I think CentOS is a logical extension of that. I think if you believe in the value proposition of open source, then you're not afraid of CentOS at all. And in fact, I think at Red Hat, we've really embraced CentOS and we've brought on a lot of the members of their community onto the Red Hat family and actually have them on staff working on CentOS. As, as somebody who works with an upstream um, project which is fairly enterprise oriented, I mean you've got a, over, it's a virtual data center manager and, and so it runs on Fedora and it runs on RHEL and it runs on CentOS and so if you w- wanted to demo it you don't want to demonstrate an upstream open source project on RHEL. Nothing against RHEL, but if you're going to buy, you know, support for RHEL, you may as well buy the, the downstream for um, Overt. So your choice is there for come to Fedora or CentOS. And so Fedora is awesome and Overt runs smoothly on it. But it's not an enterprise platform. It's not something people are going to want to deploy in the enterprise in the server room, other than you know experimental you know test platforms. So, for us, our relationship with um, CentOS is is really great because now we have this wonderful open source platform that we can demo our project on. And this is true for RDO, this is true for Gluster, this is true for a whole bunch of the you know, Manage IQ. I mean, so it's, you know, from my point of view, that's the key benefit of this relationship where we have effectively an open source downstream from our commercial downstream, mm-hmm. you know. And and now that and I think the CentOS team benefits from it as well because now that they are full time, you know, employees working on their own project, where before they were volunteers, and they were putting in the time when they could and doing a great job, but you know, they had day jobs, they had other things going on. Now that this is their full time focus, and now they can work to you know work with the, work on the special interest groups. Um, and make, you know, CentOS better for other projects, not just the ones in Red Hat. 
we partner with CentOS. Obviously, uh, it's no secret a number of the folks who work on CentOS or CentOS, I always, yeah, um, miss say it sometimes. But um, a lot of the folks that work on CentOS are actually working for Red Hat and in fact are in the same group that I'm in. Um, so obviously we're favorable to it. Um, and I mean, we see it as basically uh, a great way for people to work in the same ecosystem and have a work-alike for Red Hat Enterprise Linux um, where they're not necessarily in the position to be, like you said, you know, folks who are doing training may not be in the position to have a RHEL subscription and that's a great way for them to do work. We also want it out there for developers who just want a good way to work on a system that looks a lot like RHEL in production would look like. So, you know, we see it in that way. And there are, you know, people who have small shops or something that maybe wouldn't ordinarily have a budget for a RHEL subscription or something like that. I went through the new hire orientation just like everybody else and, you know, from day one, you know, they do a really good job of explaining to people what open source is all about and also, you know, um, the tools that are out there that we're using, that we're creating, um, give you an overview of the company, so to speak. But then, yeah, at the end of, at the, end of the orientation session, everybody gets a laptop and everybody is running RHEL on it, you know, and, and that's the standard desktop for the whole company and that's the one that's given the most support. Now, some of us who are maybe more technically oriented than, than other people in the company, we're pretty much, you know, we'll take that and maybe put Fedora on the machine, you know, and they're totally fine with that as well. They just say, you know, well, we're not maybe going to officially support it. We're yeah. like, yeah, whatever, you know, <laughs> um, but it's, but that's, you know, it's it's a no-brainer that that people are going to do that. Um, we, you know, the 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 tool set for the Linux desktop has certainly matured. That between the tools that are installed natively and then the cloud-based services that are out there, I think it's really not a big stretch for um, Red Hat to, you know, be able to successfully deploy. You know, and use uh, you know Linux-based desktops in its own business. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Is if they're not, we send Vinny over to their house. No, <laughs> um, no. I mean, you kind of come to work at Red Hat because you want to work, yeah. Yeah. you know, with these tools. Um, so it doesn't. I mean, nobody twisted my arm because I was already running Fedora when I got hired, um, and so I mean. We have people who are passionate about the work that they're doing. Most of those folks, especially that you would see here, are actually working on RHEL or Fedora in some capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Or they work with people who are working with RHEL and, and Fedora and CentOS in some capacity. So, you know, they want to work on that. So it, it, it's, I don't think it's in any way strange that folks that work here are using it. I think with Fedora, it's important to have a little bit of a history lesson about where it came from. I mean, you said that, you know, we once upon a time Red Hat sold Red Hat Linux in boxes and we sold them in retail stores that don't exist today. And uh, when we were in that business, that was not a very profitable business. That was a very hard business to be in. If you've ever tried to sell anything retail, you know how difficult that can be. Um, we were actually making better money selling hats and shirts. And so we moved to a model that was far more uh, sustainable around Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But at the same time, we did not want to abandon the traditional uh, community of users that were looking for something that was fast moving, that was keeping track with the latest from the various upstreams that we depend on, and was a great place to see new technologies first. People who are running on their home system don't have long life expectations for that system. They're willing to make that upgrade within a year or even less. And so Fedora presents an opportunity for those people to get an exposure to the latest and greatest without having to wait three or four or five years for us to turn an enterprise product out to them. And also it, it allows them an opportunity to contribute back. It gives them the opportunity to participate in the future of what enterprise Linux looks like. So Fedora is really not targeted in the same way that other Linuxes are targeted at a class of user. And it's not like, well, Fedora is for the desktop or Fedora is for the server. It's not like that. At least that's not my perspective of it. My perspective is very much that Fedora is for people who want to be involved in making the next generation of the Linux operating system ecosystem. And we do a fantastic job of balancing that mix of the latest and the greatest 
with enough stability and enough new features to make it compelling and interesting. I think if you look at things like SE Linux, uh, System D, uh, Pulse Audio, uh, GNOME 3, KDE 4, we were very early adopters in all of these technologies and actively involved in integrating them cleanly into the environment. And you see a lot of other distributions have picked up these changes and run with them long after we were done with it. So. This seems like a great place to take a short break and thank our next sponsor, Ting. That's right. Go to last.ting.com. That way you get a $50 service credit or $50 off your first device if you act before the end of June. And you'll also support this show. Now, why Ting? Ting is mobile that really makes sense. You only pay for your usage, and it's a flat $6 for each line. That's all. Any taxes applicable, you'd have to pay, and you're done. That's what I love about Ting. I've got a couple of devices. I've got three devices, actually, because it makes it so straightforward. So for a small business, I am able to deliver, and I am able to give my employees or contractors or team members or whatever they are, or honestly, people that just show up to help out, I can afford to give them cellular connectivity to stay in touch with the production team. It is very cool. And you could do it, too, even as a small business or a family. Ting makes it very possible. Go to last.ting.com to get that credit. Also support the show. And check out their savings calculator. When you go there, if this sounds like it's too good to be true, plug in your actual current usage right now, like what you actually used, and your, me your messages and your megabytes and how much your bill is and see how much you would save with Ting. I'm on, a, I'm on over two years now and I've saved over $2,000. No mysterious line items on your bill anymore. No hold customer service when you call them at one 855 ting I love that. And they also have excellent online support at help.ting.com. And Noah, how, how sweet is it that both GSM and CDMA services are available for Ting customers? Isn't that nice when you're traveling? Absolutely outstanding. In fact, one of my newest phones actually has a dual SIM slot. So what I was able to do when I was uh, in Amsterdam was put my Ting SIM in one slot and my local SIM that I bought in Amsterdam in the next slot, and I had seamless phone coverage. When I left, uh, when I left the U.S., I transitioned onto uh, the uh, whatever, Leica, I think, was the mobile service in Amsterdam. Then when I landed back in the U.S., turned my phone right back on and was right back on Ting. Love that. It's super nice. And it's great just uh, as like somebody who wants to do some testing and experimenting and see where I have different speeds. I love that. And the Nexus 5 makes that really nice and easy as well. Ting has a ton of great devices from like $70 feature phones all the way up to the latest and greatest phones like the Nexus 6 and the One Plus and the S6. I got them all. Go to last.ting.com. The other thing Ting's great at is keeping you informed on go and great ways to save money with your, with your phone, great tips for your phone, and great apps for your phone. They follow all of this stuff, and Kyra is here with her app pick of the week, and this might help you find some Wi-Fi. Did you become a master free Wi-Fi? I'm Kyra, and this is the Ting app of the take week. Take it, take it, take it, Kyra. Go, Kyra. Finding a free Wi-Fi network can be a pretty big pain. Thankfully, there's Wi-Fi Mapper, an app that proudly states to host the world's largest database of Wi-Fi networks. Using Wi-Fi Mapper is as simple as loading up the app, searching for a location, and browsing the available open networks. Like any good app, the database has been crowdsourced. Green Wi-Fi icons mean there's an open network, while gray icons mean it's unknown. Click on a Wi-Fi icon to get more information, including the network name, how many app users have accessed it, what kind of establishment it belongs to, and if a password is required. The app also connects with Foursquare, nice. so if the location is a restaurant, coffee house, that type of thing, you'll see whatever comments users from that app have Nice! Left. And if the selection of Wi-Fi networks is rather crowded, scroll down to see a list. Finally, we would encourage anyone who tries this app to help maintain the database. So if you find a listing that's no longer free, simply click no on the listing page. Otherwise, Wi-Fi Mapper is currently only on iOS. However, an Android version is in the works. Remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and check out our other great shows. Last.ting.com. Go check them out. I mean, it's so nice to finally feel like you are in control of your wireless service, you're not being taken advantage of, and you're helping make a little bit of a difference in the overall industry and fighting against that duopoly. Go check out last.ting.com. Try the savings calculator and see why Noah and I have talked about them for so long now and why we are both very happy customers of Ting. I was just looking at my Ting dashboard uh, as we're doing uh, the uh, video there, and I am at $37 right now, which is about where I land most months for an HTC One an iPhone 5, and my Nexus 5, and now an S6, which I didn't realize, I didn't even think about when I've been doing this, is on that account now. And what's great is because my usage doesn't 
like I'm not still using those other phones. I don't, like, they're not all in my pockets. Like I've given them to other people, but we're all very good about how we use them. And it really doesn't seem to impact my bill that much as long as I stick on Wi-Fi. And I use my cellular, cellular minutes as more of like my backup connectivity. And that mm-hmm. process works really well for me. And the months when I'm really busy, like, oh man, in April, I was on the phone all the time. I still right. end up in the aggregate saving so much money by switching to Ting that it really works out in the long run. Last.ting.com. Now, we wanted to know, when we went into Red Hat, how do they manage something that maybe a commercial company doesn't really have to face? They are so rooted in the community, and, and they are such a big component of that, being one of the largest companies in the world based around open source technology. They're over a billion dollar company, right? And they're all based around Linux. And yet, when they need to make a big change, they sometimes are perceived as a bit of a gorilla in the community. Say, take the re- recent system D debate. How can Red Hat roll out big innovative changes when managing sort of reactions and expectations with the community? First of all, there's, there's work that people do in the community on things like system D that are not necessarily under the direction of product management. They're basically saying, you know, this is where I see the future. I want to build a tool that fits that future or is ready for that future. And we all have to, you know, if you talk about System D, I think we all say, you know, System 5 and it was no longer capable of handling that. So the next question is, what do we have that's ready for what we need to do in that particular space? And well, I think we're an engineering-driven company. One of the things about most engineers is that we, uh, we have just enough sense to open our mouth wide enough to shove our foot in. Uh, and... I think that that certainly has contributed to some of the missteps that we've made in the past where we've done good work that made a lot of sense and done a terrible job of explaining why we did it. Um, I think that no one who has looked at the code for Sysv and it thought it was a good idea. I think everyone thinks that, you know, there is an instinctual fear that humans have for change. Mm -hmm. We are concerned by it. We are frightened by it. Change is necessary for evolution. And I do believe that we need to continue to challenge uh, the preconceived notions about the way that things work in order to make things better. Uh, with SysV in it, we were looking at uh, boot times uh, five, six, seven minutes on a default install. System D brought that down to seconds. And that is a significant impact upon the way that we do things. Uh, SysV in it involved that you cargo cult a giant pile of shell boilerplate into every init script that you wrote. System D files are six lines long. There's no reason that we should ever look back at that and say, well, that horse and buggy was a really good idea. I'm never quite sure why we stopped using that. You know? There are clear advantages to trying to solve that problem. And that's a problem that a lot of people had been trying to solve for a long period of time. You look at uh, Upstart and the work that uh, Canonical did in that space to try to solve that problem. You look at any of the other SysV uh, and it alternatives that were out there. There were lots of people that saw this as an absolutely valid problem to try to solve. It's a very difficult problem to try to solve. And OSX did an admirable job of trying to do it. And so a lot of the ideas from OSX and from other tools are visible in System D. And so I think you have a lot of smart people that are looking at a very difficult problem and trying to come up with a clever way to do that and to take advantage of the strengths of Linux. I think one of the things about SysV and it is that it was designed to be for any Unix ever anywhere. The Unix wars are over. We won. It is time that we start to leverage the strengths of Linux, and I think that System D does a very good job of that. I mean, if we if we had made System D, and for whatever reason people thought it was really not a technically apt piece of software, that it wasn't going to work for them or anybody else, that it was just something really really specialized that only Red Hat would get a benefit out of it, then it wouldn't have been adopted. And, and so I think there comes a point, I, I realize that not every piece of software is going to be welcomed with open arms. And, and I've heard the arguments for and against System D, you know, and, and, and I share, you know, it can be frustrating to have great change, you know, and yeah, we all like to kind of, oh, it worked for me yesterday, why can't I use the same tool tomorrow? But at the same token, you know, in that specific example, it was something that was 
adopted by other distributions? What what was if there's no benefit to this code, if that's not something that's you know good good enough for somebody to ad change their you know sys init altogether, that's not a trivial thing. Yeah. Why did they adopt it? So we uh, we we were on RSA a few years ago, and we don't um, we don't actually use the RSA keys anymore okay. because. Uh, because it was it was so nice of them to uh, to share all of our information yeah. with the NSA, yeah. um, but uh, we we use uh, we use a standard authenticator uh, mechanism that's a root around the open standard that YubiKey uses. So a whole bunch of us actually use YubiKeys. I have a YubiKey Nano that I use for all of my internal auth. So yeah, YubiKey makes fantastic product. Uh, Fedora has been Fedora is actually an early adopter of YubiKey, and uh, if you go to YubiKey's website, there's a lovely uh, testimonial from one of our Fedora admins about how much we. Uh, enjoy being able to use YubiKeys to control authentication into our system. Yeah, I, I joined a little bit less than two years ago. Okay. So the YubiKeys were already, um, you know, something that was in widespread use. Sure. And I like them, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's, it, it does uh, sometimes introduce some unintentional comedy yeah, when yeah. people have the little ones on their laptop. So. I use an authenticator app on my phone. Okay. Um, and and pop the number in that way, now, is that mostly because it's funny because if I'm on IRC, I watch people accidentally pop their UB keys, and I get these random six-digit numbers showing up in the channel, and you know what it is, yeah. you know, it's like okay, no, <laughs> so I was sort of like, you know, I was like, no, I'm, you know, I run the risk because if my phone runs out of juice, then you know, I may have a problem. No. But we do poker with that. <laughs> No, really. Like, so what you do is you just have three or four people hit it. Whoever's got the highest number is they win that hand. That's awesome. What is the value of a certification that reflects real-world conditions versus, you know, a paper test that is either you're artificially hobbled to where you can't access the tools that you would need, or it's tricky questions or something like that. I mean, nobody runs into your office with a uh, the network's down, pick A, B, or C. You know, that's, that's not really what happens. You, you kind of need to see, you need the hands-on, right? So that there's a reason that people make more money with that certification than people without it. I think there's a reason it consistently ranks as the number one or number two most uh, desirable certification in the industry. And that is because it means something more. Anyone can go get Linux Plus. It's not a bad cert. It says you know some stuff about Linux. It's, it's useful. But what it tells me is that you can memorize. I can train a parrot to memorize. If you go and you pass your Red Hat certifications, you know your stuff. You've been tested, you've been put in front of something, and you performed. It says, we handed you this system. It wasn't canned, it wasn't scripted, it wasn't sandboxed, it wasn't leading, it wasn't guiding. It was just the environment, you were told to do a task, and you did it. And that's the nice thing about the Red Hat certifications, is they don't have the approved way of doing it. Yeah. There is not the Red Hat way that you do it and you get five bonus points for doing it the Red Hat way. It is, you did it in the time window required, and you got it done. If you wrote that entire Kerberos setup using assembly language, well, you're crazy. But if it works, they'll pass you. It's not how, it's that you can. That certification says, I can do these things. And nothing is more valuable to a prospective employer than being able to say, hey, this person has proved in front of the highest authority, the most knowledgeable experts on this topic, that they can. And I think why you see some of the other certifications not go into that is because it's harder to grade that. It's harder to automate that. It's harder to train people to give that sort of a test. But I think that the certifications that do those sorts of hands-on focus, either as a core part or as their entirety, they're more valuable, they're more desired, and people want those uh, certified people much more. So if we've got a really good model where these people have this cert that's valuable and worth the time and the investment, why would we water that down? I, I, don't, I don't see why we would ever want to do that. And I think that there's something to be said for uh, certifications that are leading to that. And I think you see Red Hat has a good track of allowing you to show where you are in your evolutionary process as you start at the beginning of the path learning Linux and as you get all the way down to being a specialist in a specific area of technology. And 
when I first took the RHCE many, 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 many years ago, uh, it was, uh, that was the top. That was where you, you capped out at. And now we have so many levels beyond that. The next range of questions we have for Red Hat is a topic they seem very passionate about and one that I'm slightly skeptical about, but extremely interested to see where they can take it. It's about Fedora in the cloud, the VPS craze, EC2 and all of this, and making Fedora really truly relevant in the cloud. And man, when we asked this question, did they have a big opinion on that topic? First though, I want to thank this sponsor, System76 Creators of Machines to run Linux. Uh, I, w I just got done messing around with the System76 Meerkat, the new 499 tiny little rig that is a pretty powerful little workstation in a pretty amazing package. Also, uh, I have to say, still one of my favorite all-time System76 rigs for that price performance ratio is the Rattel Performance. What a great desktop built right here in the US of A. They also have that new Silverback workstation, which man, I wish I had a good reason to use, but I just really don't. Go over to System76 and check out some of their great laptops as well. They just launched a brand new servo workstation that's a monster. System76 creates these machines from the ground up to make sure that every component's going to work. They won't ship it, and, and they, I love I love their hands-on building. You have to check out some of the pictures online they've posted in the past. They create some of the nicest machines pre-built with Linux, and they have some of the best laptops available as well. You go over there and check out these laptops. They've made sure every component is going to work with Linux. They even write custom firmwares, drivers, whatever they have to to make sure it's a good experience. Go to System76. And remember, if you want just an out-of-the-box experience that's going to work really well with Linux, this is a great solution. And it's a vendor who's been in the community for a long time and have been a contributing member of that community. Go to system76.com and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Okay, no, I'm looking forward to see what the answer was when we asked about getting Fedora up in the cloud, which is an area of massive growth these days. The more people that are playing with and touching your product and using it on a daily basis, the better it is for you. I mean, you... A large user base isn't just a, a source of pride for somebody. It's not like say, oh, we have eight bazillion users, you know, we get a star on our jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's important because the more users you have, the better your product ends up being because you automatically are going to get more more traction as far as feedback and, and user productivity and, and, and whatnot. So um, I think that it is Red Hat's interest to focus on any kind of cloud deployment. I mean, isn't that what really Linux is for? The whole point of Linux is to take it and run it wherever you want to. I remember the early days when I used to explain Linux to people. It was like, I could run it on my watch, mm -hmm. you know, or I could run a Cray supercomputer with mm -hmm. it. Okay. You know, and I'm not saying Red Hat's going to go out and make watches. So, you know, yeah, right, but right. but but the point is, yeah, I mean, that's you. You should be able to have a stable platform and use it wherever you want to. Private cloud, public cloud, <clears throat> no cloud at all. You know, whatever. Yeah, I think that certainly we feel like we have a we have a strong set of features. We have a strong track record and a and a fantastic product that works really well in that space. And certainly we want to try to help build solutions that uh, work really well in that sort of an environment. I think that uh, a lot of the work that we've done lately to, uh, to minimize the default environment, to get to that just enough OS so that you can layer on top of that operating system the things that you care about and not have to deal with the security or the update tracking for the things that you don't. I think that increasingly as we get into a model where it is uh, sort of a disposable operating system, uh, where it is I will run this for five months and then I will never touch it again, I will, I will nuke it and it, will, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have that sort of a mentality in your uh, deployment strategy, then we have a lot of interesting and compelling things we can do with that. And I think you see us moving into uh, a lot of those technologies and investing in a lot of that space so that we're well integrated because there's lots and lots and lots and lots of new developments in this space every time you turn around. And one of the things that is a significant challenge is keeping up with all of that. And one of the things that Red Hat can help you with is to be on top of those technologies and already have them well integrated, well tested, and give you a starting point to build the solution that works for you and not the solution that Red Hat tells you is the only one. 
and we're certainly not the only player in the industry that's doing that, but I think that we have a very proven track record of building solutions around open source, and we plan to take that model into the cloud and the container and the VPS space. It is nice to be able to ping people and say, hey, this is broken and have their attention, mm -hmm. but um, to be perfectly honest, the way open source works, I can do that with people who work for competitors as well. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of all about how do you approach it, and when you have people who care about their project, they're really not going to turn you away just because you work for Red Hat and they don't, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody comes to me and, and says, uh, you know, we have a problem with RPMOS tree, can you help us out? I'm going to take their problem to Colin Walters and say, hey, somebody wants to use this. How can we, you know, do you have time to look at this bug that they're reporting or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think is great about our culture, though, is you learn very quickly when you run into a bug, you open a bug. You don't just complain about it. You, you know, you say, okay, I ran into this. I guess that's good and bad. Like, I start adopting the new release of Fedora uh, pretty much on the alpha. I will wait until something's in alpha state, and then I'll go ahead and do a clean install on one of my spare laptops and start using that. And then it isn't uncommon in that situation to, you know, run into a bug and be, well, I guess the next 20 minutes are about getting this fixed instead of whatever it was I was planning to work on. Uh, but that results in a lot better software for our end users. So We are lucky enough that we have an open source ecosystem that powers all the tools that we care about, or most of the tools that we care about, and we invest in those tools much in the same way that if, you, uh, if you're a farmer, you have a very good idea of what's, what's important to not waste money on. You do not buy the cheap tractor. We are the same sort of a model. We, uh, we use LibreOffice constantly, and so it is a no-brainer from our perspective to invest in that technology. Are we likely to go out and brand LibreOffice as a solution that we sell to people? Probably not in the near term, although I don't speak authoritatively on future topics or anything like that. Uh, but I do think that, you know, when we look at the technologies that are important to our customers, that are important to us as a customer, because we are a part of our own ecosystem, yeah, absolutely, we look at those and we invest. And so do we have this huge team of people that are maintaining games inside Red Hat? Absolutely not. Not a core focus for us. Do we all love games? Sure. Do we include games in Fedora? Absolutely. But... We're not, we're not in-house writing games. We are in-house investing in LibreOffice. We do invest in uh, Evolution. We do invest in the desktop stack. We do invest in things like X and Wayland and technologies like that that are important for us to be successful uh, in tons of server technology and virtualization technology and container technology and so on and so forth. I mean, there's an, any number of spaces. So, yeah. And I think that if you, if you objectively look at any company that has a significant IT presence that wants to have control over their own destiny, they're doing the same thing. Our culture is very much focused around uh, empowering you to be productive and to be successful and not as concerned about you clocking in and clocking out. So if you work best at 3 in the morning and you can work with your teammates in that way, then Red Hat is cool with it. Now, obviously, if you work at 3 in the morning and you're as your teammates don't, then there's a disconnect. We have so much asynchronous communication in our company, it's not even funny. You know, and we and we deal with it, and and it's not, and I don't even say we deal with it like it's a huge hardship. We just do it. You know, I mentioned before, my boss, you know, uh, up until uh, a few weeks ago, you know, he was in China. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I had a asynchronous communication all the time. A bulk of the overt community is in Eastern Europe and Israel. So, you know, you know that's. That's a that's a totally different uh, way of dealing with things. So I think the fact that we're globally dispersed helps mitigate the whole thing with remotes. But I also think the fact that this this company recognizes that talent doesn't have to be in a meeting room, in a boardroom to get things done. You know, we we can get we can get ourselves together in other ways and and make that happen. So um, I've worked kind of. Diverse. So I worked for Novell for two years. I worked for Citrix for a year uh, on CloudStack. And then I've worked for a number of publishing companies and worked as a freelancer, too. So some of the disparity or difference is not so much 
Red Hat versus another IT company, but you know, Red Hat versus publishing is wildly different, right? Right. Um, so here's what I would say um, compared to, say, Citrix or uh, other companies with a fairly hierarchical structure. Um, I feel like I can email anybody in the company, up to and including Jim, if I really, really needed to, and ask for a response and ask for, you know, something to be done or ask for information or whatever. Um, without necessarily having to go through all the chain of command to get to them. I feel like, and I'm fairly confident that if I sent an email to Jim about a matter that was important, I would get a response in a timely fashion and it would be taken seriously. Uh, I've worked at other companies where if someone's a VP and you're not at least director or something, don't bother sending them an email because they're not even going to reply to you. You're beneath their notice. Um, and I've heard that I've felt it personally, and I've also heard it described. Um, and, you know, uh, that is a big difference. While we have, obviously, we have a hierarchy, um, it's a fairly flat organization. You can get a lot done from day one, um, and you don't need to be, you know, up here on the org chart to identify a problem or identify something that needs to be done and work that problem. And people are generally, you know, I know when I was very new and didn't know all the procedures for everything, I made a number of, you know, boo-boos in terms of, like, I'm going to go start this, and people would be like, we've, we've had that for six years, it's over here. Um, you know, but they're also pretty nice about it in terms of, like, I see somebody trying to get something done, so I'm going to support that, and I'll be, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, uh, that's nice, Junior, the, but what you want's over here. But they're not mean about it, you know. Um, and I like that about our culture. We want to get things done. We want to do the right thing. This is going to sound weird, but I'm, I'm sort of biased since I'm in the community space. I mean, right. for me, I think the most compelling feature that Red Hat has to offer any customer of any product is basically transparency. Yeah. Which sounds really cliche and corny, no, but it's very much what we do because you can see what we're doing. It's out there everywhere. And as we talked about earlier, people will complain yeah. about what we're doing, you know. But the fact is, they know what we're doing. You don't always get that with other, um, with other companies. And, and so I think that... The transparency is a big advantage. I think um, our strong and powerful, again going to my strengths, our strong and powerful communities that we have are a huge advantage. The fact that we, you know, we make an effort to, you know, diversify our communities uh, like on the corporate level. We don't like it when our communities are heavily red hat only, you know. And sometimes that happens just through natural attrition, and we and then when that does, we work very very hard to stop that and get more companies and get more individuals who are independently oriented involved in our communities and whatnot. So, um, so our, and so that kind of you know real sharing and real open source um, you know um, diversity, so to speak, I, for lack of a better word. Sure. Um, you know, you get into technical features. I think things like what I alluded to earlier, we have, it's, it's amazing how many products we have. I used to think, honestly, I used to think it was a disadvantage because I would be sitting there thinking, okay, now they're doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, how do they split their focus? And it's not really, it's not, it's not a divisive split. It's an iterative um, effect where you know, yeah, we had, you know, overt works on virtual machine management, you know, and our work with RDO and, and OpenStack is cloud, and you would think, okay, that's, that's combative. It's not. They're iterative, because if your user doesn't need cloud, they can use overt. If they want support, they can go to the downstream and get rev, things like that. And, and, and if, they, but they need, if they need cloud elasticity, then they'll go to cloud. We have a great track record of supporting customers. We have a great track record of having excellent software. Um, 
I think that a lot of people buy into not not only the value proposition that Red Hat has on the enterprise side, obviously they buy into the open source value proposition, but they also buy into the um, obvious nature of the company. We're an open company. And I think that that speaks a lot. You know, I think that that says a lot about um, who do you want to do business with, okay? Um, and our corporate culture is one I think that a lot of people are comfortable doing business with. These are my friends. Yeah. These are my coworkers. These are they're people who have started at Red Hat and gone to other places and come back. People who have gone in each one of these directions. These are the people I drink beers with at conferences. These are the people that I collaborate with to solve difficult problems. We're all in this together. We are unique in our industry in that when we are successful, we are all successful. Red Hat's success does not come at the detriment of any of the other Linux distributions. They all do interesting, creative, intelligent, passionate, fantastic work. And we are all better as a result of that. And I think when companies don't realize that truth, that we are all better by collaborating, then they falter. If a company says, we're going to do our own thing, we're not going to collaborate with anyone else, we're going to do all of our stuff in-house, you're adopting a proprietary model to make an open source solution, and that doesn't work. It doesn't work any more than putting carrots where your tires were and trying to drive down the road. It's not successful. You can say all day long about how open source you are, but unless you walk the walk, you're not going to succeed, Oracle. And... <laughs> And I mean that because it's really easy to say you're open source and it's really hard to do it. But I don't think that the Linux distributions have that problem. I think the Linux distributions are far more like Baskin Robbins. It really is. Which one is your favorite flavor? Can you explain to me why you prefer one flavor of ice cream over another? Most people can't. Unless you're a food taster for a living, you probably can't answer that question. But you know what you like. I like Fedora for a number of reasons. If you like Ubuntu, use it. Great. Makes me happy. I don't care. It's not worth fighting over. That time in our history, it is fun to be silly with your friends and to say, oh, Gen 2, you're still compiling. But at the end of the day, the Gen 2 people have done fantastic work in keeping cutting edge with new technologies. They have patches for stuff I don't even know is broken yet. Debian is doing amazing work in stabilization. Uh, Ubuntu does fantastic work on solving problems that they have facing in front of their customers. Uh, we're all solving hard problems and the last thing we need to be doing is sniping at each other. We can be working together and we do work together so well that we don't need to let our choice of ice cream flavors divide us unnecessarily. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast, episode 370. I want to say thank you to Ann, Tom, Brian, and Joe and the crew down at Red Hat. And of course, a big thank you to producer Q5Sys and big thank you to Noah for getting all of that done. And uh, I can't wait to actually uh, look back at this in a few years and uh, look at Red Hat today when we record this episode, when they're celebrating that huge milestone of their stock hitting all-time high, and, and see where they're at in a few years and see if this was a turning point for them, if this was uh, you know, the next gear or what. They're definitely not slowing down. That seems to be pretty apparent. Uh, Noah, any closing thoughts? Any, uh, any, do you want to go back, Noah? Are you ready to go back? And one of the things I don't know if uh, you shared with the audience was uh, that they, they have these buildings out there they call Red Hat Towers, and this is kind of a common right. thing, right? Yeah, so the Red Hat Towers um, in, in Raleigh, uh, they, they built the tower, and it, it follows a very specific structure. So there are certain offices that are on certain floors, and the floors are obviously that out in a certain way, and there's a certain decor that goes around uh, the floors, uh, you know, and, and the office chairs are a certain brand, and the desks are a certain brand, and, you know, everything is, is set up a certain way. What I found out was there are 60 of these towers that are practically identical all over the world, and so um, I believe it was Joe that we were talking to was talking about how he works on the Overt team, and the Overt team is based in Tel Aviv. Mm. Uh, he goes, so his quote-unquote home office is, is you know his 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 place is is Tel Aviv, but he's only been there a handful of times. <clears throat> the rest of the time, he works as as he put it in his bunny slippers at his house with a voice. Isn't telephone that great? And his work and his work issue laptop. And the, <clears throat> so he was explaining. I said, you know, is it hard to as as a person that doesn't work inside the Raleigh office to find your way around? He goes, not at all. He goes, if you've been to one Red Hat Tower, you've been to all of them. And so I take my laptop, I take my work issued ID, and I walk around the place like I own it because I have been to a Red Hat Tower. Therefore, I've been to all the Red Hat Towers, and. 
you know, that takes a lot of foresight into a company that that they that they plan uh, and they organize their their organization in such a way that you can you can literally have collaboration of thousands of employees spread across thousands of miles uh, and all have them working on, uh, you know, maybe one person is Tel Aviv and one person is in Raleigh and one person is in Dallas uh, and they all work in, in Red Hat offices. And even though they don't work in the same Red Hat office because they are running the same operating system on the same laptop with the same telephone that happens to be connected over VoIP, they can call their extension just as if they were sitting five offices over mm -hmm. and they would never know the difference. It's pretty and, neat. You know, it did. It made an impression on me. Yeah. Uh, it makes you think, boy, how could I apply some of this stuff to my own business sometimes? It's kind of yeah. fascinating. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chris, let me tell you. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to go into a lot of that on air, but there there were tons of things that I'm like, you know what? AltaSpeed is implementing this next. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Well, uh, I, I think that was great. Thank you again to Red Hat for doing that. And uh, if you'd like to uh, participate in this show, add some content of your own, maybe make some suggestions, some app picks, go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. That's the subreddit that powers this show. You can also join us live over at jblive.tv. We've got an embedded chat room over there. We're talking to you guys between segments, getting your ideas in real-time follow-up all the time. Uh, I love this right now. Like a... Uh, uh, North uh, Ranger in there is talking about uh, Revolution OS. And it's interesting to go back and look at that 2001 full movie, which is on yeah. YouTube, in comparison to where Red Hat's at now. And he's making a great point. Uh, you can hang out in our chat room and make a great point, too. We love that. JBLive.tv. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to find out when we're doing these shows live. And Noah, if people want to find you throughout the week, you got some place they could check out? At Kernel Linux on Twitter, I finally reached 700 uh, Twitter followers, which is uh, which is a new uh, all-time high for for me. And of course, you being at Chris Las and redoing your your Twitter handle, you have managed to. You know, I've had that Twitter handle for like two three years. Now you've had yours for I think coming up on 30 days, and you've hit a thousand. You're a little over a yeah, thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but if they're not aware of that, then they have you have you have you've done uh, Twitter funkery, right? Because you yeah, have a new we Twitter swapped handle. around. We have two Twitter handles now. We have Jupiter Signal, which is like the network news account. And you can find out about new episodes and releases and schedule changes. That's Jupiter Signal. And then my personal account is Chris Les, where I'll probably tweet something. But even something if they were following somebody. you at Chris Les, they have to refollow you true. now under your new. Chris That's how LES. the Twitter works. Yeah, because yeah. uh, I change yeah. names, you have to refollow me. Even if you followed me in the past, I know it mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense, but it's yeah. it's some sort of buffoonery, I guess. And uh, you have you have provocative Twitter posts, so not, it's worth it to follow. Yes, both your very provocative, one. extremely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very provocative. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like yeah. I should maybe I should start like uh, tweeting about like controversial barbecue recipes. Apparently, yeah. when, or, we, you, when know, you and I talk about barbecue. Tweeting. Yes. Yeah. In fact, in fact, there was th this came up at self. We were having like we're sitting around, <laughs> we're having beers, we're talking, and all of a sudden, uh, this guy goes. He goes. By the way, that Chris guy, he's totally wrong about the barbecue thing. You're right on the the head. And so I sat him down on camera, and I'm like, "Tell me about barbecue." And then he like backed off, and I'm like, "Dude, that's because <laughs> listen, you have an untenable position. Here's my position: if you cook it with like coals in a nice charcoal uh, barbecue, or like a big yes. green egg, or something it's like broke. that, that counts as barbecue. You, your position true. is untenable. Your position is it only counts of barbecue if it was cooked in a hole yeah. in the ground yeah or something that resembles a hole in the ground like a uh, like uh, one of those big smoker things but yeah. see i feel like my position was misrepresented i feel like people took my position and saying that i thought propane was barbecuing see i feel like people misrepresented where i was at on that position and so well, to be fair to be fair the propane grill they still call it a barbecue grill they just call it a propane powered barbecue grill i don't care what they call it noah I don't care yeah, what I they don't care, call it. I don't okay. care what they call the Weber round thing that just because you put coals in it, it's still not barbecue. Yeah, that's, that's where we just have a disagreement. That's where we have a disagreement where you're fundamentally wrong and I'm fundamentally correct. And that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> All right. Well, join us live next week. And we'd love to get your feedback to Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or click the contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. But that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Family is text messaging me. This is crazy. This is so crazy. Oh my, all right. Really, this is to be expected. You're about to go on air. So, of course, everyone needs something right this minute. Why does it work like this, though, man? Why does I it always work? That's, that's, that's I, if there's anything that makes me believe in a uh, super power, like a, an all seeing <laughs> being, it's that this kind of stuff. And Noah, I know you're with me on this. Like, it's too, like, yeah. it, it's, it's too yeah. consistent, right? Like, yeah. it's, too, it's right. too consistent to be random. It, it's not just one thing. It's not like it's just Telegram or just when you're on the air. Like I can go, I can walk into FedEx, and the second that I walk into FedEx, like five other people walk into FedEx, and it's not like oh, it's right after dinner, right before dinner, right before lunch, right at any time of the day. Like it could be like two thirty-one one day, and like ten, you know, fifty-one the next day. But 
as soon as I walk in, like five other people walk into FedEx. And I'll ask her, I'll say, oh, it's a really busy day today. No, no one has walked in the door since you got here. But like, we all arrive at the same time. And when the phone rings at the shop, it doesn't just ring once. It rings like seven times all at one time. And then it's dead for like four hours. And then it rings like six times again at one time. But everything comes in like clumps. It's strange. Very strange. Uh, it's kind of like, um, like the entire universe has, it's like everybody is like yeah. interconnected in some weird way, man. It's some weird yeah. interconnected. Uh, like, like, uh, this, this family member who, who's texting me right now, I probably haven't uh, heard from them for, for six months. Yeah. Yeah, nah, which makes it months, all the more, months. which makes it all the more worse because now you feel like you have to respond otherwise, because they don't do it very often. It just right, maybe, maybe it. photons, right, maybe subconsciously I'm expecting it to happen, therefore my vibration of expectation is going out into the universe, and the universe maybe. is responding by delivering exactly what I expect, even though I don't know I'm expecting it because I'm expecting it subconsciously. Yes, maybe. It's I don't the only so, thing that makes maybe. total and absolute sense. <laughs> well, that or maybe, perhaps, there's a Telegram group, a group called Let's Piss Off Chris that many people may or may not be a part of that may or may not try to coordinate trying to irritate you. That could be a thing. Uh, no, I'm not confirming or denying the existence of such a group. So, I should expect a free Ferrari. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>